This video is one that is really truly special to me, and that's because we're checking in on our old friend Cecilia, who I'm super proud of. Now I want to remind you really quick who Cecilia is by rolling this clip that's three years old. When you tell somebody that you have schizophrenia, how do you want them to react? I want them to not be afraid of me and not to look at me any differently than they had looked at me before. So now that you remember who Cecilia is, let's call her together to discuss three things. One, what it's like for her to watch that old SBSK video that's three years old. Two, what she's up to today. And three, how she's coping with the chaos of 2020. Let's do this. Cecilia, it's good to see you again. It's great to see you as well. Wow, it's been, it's been a while. It's actually been three years since we filmed our first interview. I, I actually have a hard time believing that. So the first question I wanted to ask you, how have you changed since three years ago? When we first talked, uh, that was right after the, uh, the same year as the TEDx PSU talk. And at that time, I was struggling a lot with uh, the stress of that, to be quite honest, because uh, that was the first time ever having like a viral video. Uh, at the time, I wasn't open about it then. I was also struggling with addiction. Uh, so I was uh, misusing my medication. How often do you hear voices? My, my uh, hallucinations are almost 24 seven. Uh, it's something that I just have learned to live with. In my producer mind, one of the things that I hope to accomplish with this interview is to show people how you've grown and progressed since we first met in 2017. So to do that, I wanted to include a clip or two from your old interview. Is that okay? I wanna make sure that that wouldn't be triggering for you to see yourself. No, I think that it's, it's important to see sort of that contrast because uh, again, there's been a lot of a lot of change, uh, it's a lot of growth that has happened. It started out as shadows and whispers and it just sort of developed into what I have now. But at first I thought I was possessed. And let me just tell you, that's a lot a lot more scary than realizing you have a, a chemical imbalance inside your head. Back when we had comments, I know a lot of people were commenting, why didn't she make eye contact? Is that something that you would like to comment on? Yeah, uh, so I noticed this comments as well. Uh, during my first uh, interview, I had a hard time making eye contact uh, for two reasons. One, I also struggle with the diagnosis of PTSD. Uh, so that sometimes makes it difficult for me to give eye contact, uh, especially when I'm being uh, I'm symptomatic. Uh, another reason is I was struggling with a uh, particular hallucination and I was in that direction. Uh, so to try to not be distracted by that hallucination, I looked a different way. Do you ever go back and watch your SBSK video from 2017? I have a hard time watching a special books by special kids one, to be honest, because that was just a really rough time in my life. I look very different than I did even in the TEDx talk. I look very different than I do now. And sometimes I look at who I was then, I, I see a lot of pain and that's hard for me to see. I also, that's actually the only video that I have that you can see me like visibly being symptomatic. I usually don't allow myself, like I don't allow recordings when I feel, because I'm self-conscious. Um, so it's hard for me to watch, but I think it's important uh, that, that, that the video is out there and but it is difficult to watch. If you could go back to 2017 and give that version of yourself some advice, what would you say? Sleep, sleep, sleep's your friend. It's just because you work hard and you're a workaholic, you can work hard on self-care. That was a, a very difficult lesson for me to learn. Also, listen to your support network. Uh, and take your medicine as prescribed. I appreciate you speaking so honestly about your past, but let's talk a little bit about the present now. How have you been coping with the current year? Ooh, I, I mean, I think that everyone can relate that 2020 has been uh, quite, quite an unusual year. Uh, when it comes to coping with it, let me just 
Okay, let me first start off on saying I was displaced uh, for four months uh, during, uh, during this, this COVID. Uh, I was supposed to be doing a talk with Mental Health America in St. Louis right when the world shut down. And I was very, very lucky to have been in a place where the, the coordinator of the event opened their house up to me, let me stay there for four months because I live in Brooklyn and I just did not feel safe to come back home. And also I was struggling with some of my symptoms as well. Uh, I had to change my relationship with the news. Uh, when COVID first started happening, I would obsess with watching the numbers. I was watching the news all the time. And that made me uh, sort of spiral into some, uh, I don't want to say delusional thinking, more, more, more like paranoia uh, and it also was a, a huge negative on my mental health. And I struggled also coping in a new environment because I was not at my home. Uh, even though they had a lovely guest room for me, I actually slept on the living room couch uh, just because as someone with psychosis, my hallucinations sometimes are very difficult in the morning or when I'm having, say, a nightmare and adjusting to waking up, my hallucinations, the things in my nightmares are sometimes still there. So waking up you know, in the living room with these two adorable dogs trying to wake me up and be like, let me outside. That was a much more positive way to wake up than me in a room by myself with my hallucination. All right, so full transparency, this is our fourth time attempting to film this interview. The first two times you postponed, and then the third I postponed. Why did you postpone twice? Oh my, uh, nervous, shy. Um, also, I was, uh, so in March, my mental health wasn't very good because uh, I did have uh, experiencing a lot of those symptoms at the beginning of like when COVID got prevalent like here in the United States. I mean, to be completely honest, I was worried that I, I would sometimes look at the comments that would be on like my TEDx talk and compared to the special books by special kids video. And because I was visibly symptomatic in that video and they would compare it to the TEDx talk, individuals would think that my, uh, my illness, illness or my, my condition had progressed or I was getting worse and then it sort of like it, they would look at the timeline and sometimes they would, they would compare it and thinking that I was getting worse. So I didn't want to add a inaccurate uh, data point uh, there and I didn't want people to come up with a false uh, conclusion. I feel like what you just said is so important because it shows that progress isn't always linear. Even though you're doing better today, do you sometimes have symptoms like you did in 2017? I do, yeah. Uh, I'm lucky though that my uh, episodes are fewer, fewer and farther in between. Also, I've learned a lot more coping skills uh, and I've learned also uh, different red flags uh, when it comes to knowing when I'm going to spiral. Uh, so catching it early on instead of letting myself spiral. Like if I'm starting to feel symptomatic, I know, okay, I need to reach out to a friend. I need to sleep. I need to uh, take, a, take a break from work right now. Just by talking to you today, I can see you're much more vibrant than you were three years ago. And you seem much more joyful. Is that true? Yeah, it's, I'm in a much, much better place, even uh, with acceptance of my diagnosis. Also, I've shifted uh, my advocacy a lot as well. I'm really happy that you brought up your advocacy because I've been following you and I know you started your own organization to help others with psychosis. Tell me all about that. Yeah, so we founded the organization Students with Psychosis, which is a nonprofit. We focus on empowering college students and advocates globally. And we do this through community building and collaboration. And you're doing this full time now? Yeah, full-time advocate over here. Uh, it's, it's a full-time job, but it's also becomes a lifestyle. I absolutely love the family that it's created. Would it be correct to say that you've become a resource for people who are in the spot you were when we filmed our first interview? Yeah, it, and I think that's the importance of why we uh, welcome advocates and students, because 
we're at different places in our journeys. I still learn a lot from the students, but it's great to be able to have that perspective of talking to someone who is first diagnosed versus someone who was diagnosed like five or six years ago. Uh, it's be, we could talk about different coping skills. We could talk about how our diagnosis has changed throughout the years. And we actually have coming on one of your student leaders within the organization. Is that right? Yeah, we're so lucky to have one of our student leaders with us today. Uh, something that I've started been, been doing when I either give talks or now even when I do interviews is I try to bring a fellow advocate or a student leader on the interview with me or at the talk with me. So I appreciate you, Chris, for that, for, you know, going for this, because I think it's important that we are showing that people with psychosis are a part of community. We work together because uh, there's a lot of individual stories out there. And I think that because the world often sees us as individuals, we're more likely to be taken advantage of or scapegoated instead of being seen as a marginalized community. Well, I'm happy to be a part of your initiative and to meet a new friend. So let's say hi to Sarah. What is your diagnosis, Sarah? Um, well, I've been diagnosed with many different things. First, it was um, depression with psychotic symptoms. Then it was bipolar with psychotic symptoms. And eventually I got the diagnosis of schizo schizoaffective. So that's my current diagnosis. What is it like when you're a person who experiences psychosis and then for the first time, you're meeting a lot of other people who have lived through the same thing. It was just really eye-opening to see, I'm not in this alone. It doesn't have to, I can be properly treated. And if I get that proper treatment, I can be just as successful as anyone else. And it was really inspiring. And it was comforting to know that I wasn't the only one, you know, I didn't feel so alone anymore. When you first found Cecilia and saw the video she did originally on SBSK, what was it like for you? Honestly, it was like a little light bulb went off in my head and I was like, oh my God, this person is successful and talking about things that I struggle with. And by seeing this, it helped me realize that I can help other people by doing this and I can, I just felt like I could really relate. And that was just so helpful because at that point when I first saw her, I hadn't really been that open about my diagnosis or parts of my diagnosis, especially the, psycho the psychosis. Um, so it really made me feel like I wasn't going crazy, you know, I, I, you know, I found someone else that I could relate to and someone that I could look up to. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. And before I let you go, I want to ask, what's the most important thing you've learned through students with psychosis? Um, I think the most important thing I, is to acknowledge that I have this problem and be more gentle with myself because before I, I would kind of think why can't I overcome this why can't I make it stop I, I don't feel powerful enough to make this stop and then I really learned it's kind of about living with what you have and then making the best of it so it's I, I don't want to just sit and do nothing about it and you know suffer in silence which I did for so many you know months and everything um, I really want to take action to move forward and I may hit some bumps along the road and I have to live with, you know, a lot of, I, I have a lot of auditory hallucinations and it's, um, it used to be almost 24 seven. And now that I'm on a new medication, it's a lot less, but it's still a lot. But instead of wanting those to be completely gone, I've learned, okay, this is a part of me. It doesn't mean that it defines who I am as a person. I can still continue on with my life and really you know, accept that the voices are there, take precautions, make, you know, um, get some, uh, I guess it's, uh, what do you call it, accommodations for school, um, and be honest with people about what's going on with me and not be, you know, I'm trying not to be really scared of it anymore. I'm trying to, it's still scary at times, but if it makes sense, I'm trying to familiarize myself with it more so that it doesn't come as such a fright, become such a frightening experience in the future. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Cecilia, is there anything else you'd like to say about Sarah before we let her go? Sarah, I think that you are so amazing, so powerful, and honestly, I'm so happy that you are part of our Students with Psychosis family. You make our family better just by your presence, and thank you for, for joining in on this call today. Thank you so much, Cecilia. It was great to meet you, Sarah. Thanks for inviting Sarah on, Cecilia. It's really neat to see firsthand what you're doing. This web chat series, 
I feel like I just showed my age by saying web chat. But anyway. Just a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. This web chat series is called the How Are You series. And we started it in 2020. The reason we started it is because we just wanted to check in on past people we've interviewed and make sure they're doing well. And if they're not doing well, just make sure that they know that somebody cares about them. So my question for you, why is it important to call our friends and ask them, how are you? It's extremely important because not everyone is able to reach out. We hear a lot of people saying, oh, reach out when you need help. Reach out if you need help. Not Sometimes not someone's in a mental space where they're able to reach out. You sometimes need to reach out to them. So go ahead and call uh, even your, your friends that you think are strong or, you know, have a smile on their face at work or at school. You know, you don't maybe know what's happening behind the scenes. So I encourage to reach out and even if they're doing okay, like it's okay to just have like a, a chat and a talk with them. It's important to know that people care. Thank you so much, Cecilia, for being so open about your past and your present. I hope you know just the impact that's going to have on so many people, the positive impact. And before you go, I have to tell you. I am just, I don't, I feel like it's cheesy to tell another adult I'm proud of them. But I am, I'm, I'm really proud of you to see how far you've come and see what you're doing now. And seeing all the people you're helping, it brings me a lot of joy. And I am, I'm proud of you. Thank you, right back at you from another adult to another adult. I'm proud of you too, Chris. Thank you. You know I'm always here for you. If you ever need anything, just send me a message. And I'm really glad we could catch up today. Same likewise. Thank you so much.